and by events in 50 countries and five different continents. I'd also like to, uh, without going into too much more of his background, there is a, I was telling Stephen when I said hello to him when he came in today, I had read his piece in today's Globe. He writes op-ed pieces in uh, Sunday Globe, and today's Globe, the back page of the uh, opinion section of the Globe is, is his piece on Iran's best diplomat takes on U.S. power. Very fascinating story that would get uh, on the uh, nightly news or whatever, whatever channel you're listening to or many, many other publications. So I, I recommend keep an eye open for his opinion pieces regularly. I think it's a couple times a month on, on in the globe. So lastly, last I just wanted to quote uh, something from his biography. Uh, Stephen Kinzer was awarded an honorary doctorate by Dominican University in River Forest, Illinois. The citation said that, quote, those of us who have had the pleasure of hearing his lectures or talking to him informally will probably never see the world in the same way again. End of quote. I thought that was a good uh, kind of summary of uh, our perspective on Stephen Kinzer. And the last thing I'd like to say, I, uh, Stephen Kinzer, I think, was here for two, two years, within the last two years, and then he was here about a year before that. So he's been a couple times in the last two, three, three, four years before this, and then before that, uh, other times. <laughs> so we, we should have, it'd be nice if we have a Stephen Kinzer Community Church uh, publication ourselves, something we should consider. And I also think we need to have a, I was looking this morning, we're trying to get our library more uh, arranged. There's got to be one or two of Stephen Kinzer's books there, but it'd be nice to have a section for your books at Community Church. I think that people would appreciate that. With respect, the last thing I want to say, though, I did introduce Stephen, but uh, not the last time he was here, the time before, and I, I said uh, if Stephen Kinzer didn't exist, we would have to, it would be good if we could recreate him, because of all the good things he's done. But then I, as I thought about that today, I was thinking, uh, Stephen Kinzer cannot be recreated, he's, he's Stephen Kinzer, and uh, all of us, none of us can be recreated, we, we are who we are, and Stephen Kinzer is, is unique and has done a remarkable uh, contribution as far as journalism, uh, writing, teaching, and uh, informing uh, the rest of us about important, <coughs> important events, ideas, and situations that we would otherwise uh, be ignorant of. So without further ado, I uh, ask Stephen to come up here and uh, address us. I, I hope Stephen will be able to answer some questions after this. wonderful to be in this room and uh, a lot of karma coming off of the people that have spoken here before. Uh, I have a particular connection to one of the uh, superstars of uh, peace and justice on that map. Howard Zinn was my college professor. Oh. Remember that line about as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. I think that might have been where some of it started. Um, you know, it was a long time ago uh, and I'm not sure I remember much about the details of what we covered in, in Zinn's class, but I do remember the main thing I took away from that. Uh, and that was my view I got from Zinn that uh, you shouldn't just buy the official narrative. There's another way of looking at things. Create your own narrative. Don't just assume that everything has happened and is happening the way you are told. And so I've tried to spend my career uh, pursuing that principle. Um, so I have a have possibly disappointing announcement for you. I'm not uh, speaking on the topic that uh, Zinn <laughs> is on the uh, poster. I'll probably touch on it. I, everything I say has to do with uh, foreign policy, and that has to do with Trump, of course. But uh, I have a new topic. And uh, we've agreed that for those of you that are not happy, uh, that all the money that you paid to get in will be refunded to you <laughs> if you're not happy with my new topic. My new topic is, what did I do yesterday afternoon? That's a speech I've never given before, and this one won't be given ever again. My normal speech about Trump and foreign policy, 
I just press a button and you can get that in a lot of different places. This is one that's going to be unique. What did I do yesterday afternoon? Well, I was also in New York. Um, I didn't have to go hear Rob because I knew I was going to hear him today. Um, but I was invited to go to New York for a small meeting with the foreign minister of Iran. So I spent a couple of hours yesterday afternoon with Javad Zarif and about maybe 15 other people around a table. Um, since uh, most of you will never have that opportunity and nothing will come out of this uh, meeting other than hopefully saving the minds of some journalists, I thought I would try to take advantage of the fact that I was there. And uh, I actually went home and typed up my notes, like a good journalist should. And so I want to share with you a little bit about my meeting with Javad Zarif. Uh, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, Zarif uh, came to the United States to go to uh, prep school in California when he was 17. He stayed and went to San Francisco State College where he got a degree in international relations. He later went on to graduate study. He has a PhD in international relations from the University of Denver. Uh, so although we in America are totally ignorant about Iran, and Iran is very knowledgeable about us. He has lived for years in the United States and understands us, I think, a lot better than many of us understand ourselves. Um, he has that great chance that, that I've been given as a journalist working in other countries, which is to be able to see your country from the outside, the way it looks to, to other people. Um, Zarif uh, went back. He became a diplomat, I think, in part because of his fluency in English and his studies of international relations. Finally, he became the uh, Iranian ambassador to the UN. And then when uh, President Rouhani was elected, he selected uh, Zarif as his foreign minister. So uh, I don't want to say young. He has a white beard. But everybody that's younger than me, I think it was young. <laughs> so uh, dynamic, uh, forceful, very thoughtful. Not adjectives that we would apply to members of our own cabinet. <laughs> um, so we had about, as I said, maybe 15 people around the room. He came in. You have to go up to the uh, Iranian mission to the UN, which makes me, you know, like, this could be possible for any of you, but I know this for sure. Yesterday, I was photographed by the FBI. <laughs> I know that. Nobody ever goes into that office that is not photographed by the FBI. And there's two officers of the uh, Duke Dignitary Protection Force sitting outside, but I'm sure I wouldn't even want to guess what's the facial recognition, how fast it goes, and everything, all the files that come up as soon as you walk through that door. Um, so when we sat down, it was a pretty, uh, it, was a, it was a good discussion, although there was one aspect about it that I found disturbing. I'm going to get to that a little bit later on. So let me just tell you, what we, he didn't make an opening statement, and he just asked for questions. Um, so the tone, as I said, it was more or less respectful, but I still could sense, certainly among some of the journalists, that I'm going to get to this later, uh, this feeling that um, after we represent America, and you represent Iran, I hate this attitude about journalists. The journalist does not represent any country. The journalist is supposed to write down what people say and transmit that and analyze it. You don't, you don't work for the team. This is one of the things that I hate about where American journalism has gone. We have this sense that our country is a team, and everybody has a role. The president has a role, the Supreme Court has a role, Congress has a role, and the press has a role. They have a role in trying to promote what we're doing in the world. I hate that. That's not our role. We're not on anybody's team. Uh, but you could sense that that's not the unanimously held view when I was in that room. So, first question. Israel is the big problem for you. Why don't you deal with Israel and make a deal with Israel and remove this problem? Here's the reef. It is not the root of the problem. It is Israel trying to find a smokescreen behind which to hide its aggression, its violation of the human rights of Palestinians, and its inability to accept Palestinians as a reality. We are not the ones who stood next to a nuclear weapons factory and threatened to destroy another country. He's talking about Netanyahu. We'll, we will never use our missiles except in self-defense. Can he say that? And then as the reporter pressed on about Palestine, he kept, say, he kept saying, I quote this, Palestine is not our problem. We've said that we will accept whatever they accept. 
And this is an old position of Iran going back to the first Arab League peace plan. The Iranian position is whatever the Palestinians decide that they can accept, we sign on. So we're not pushing them to do this or not to do that. That's another problem. And when he talks about his region, he doesn't include that. He's thinking that that's a whole other complex of problems. And we're not deeply involved in that. We support them. And uh, whatever they agree with, we will agree with. Next question was about how has the tone from Europe been changing as he's had this he's at the UN General Assembly. He's been meeting with the UN far, uh, EU foreign policy chief and with a number of European leaders. Uh, I thought this was an interesting insight. He said, the tone has steadily become more serious. Now it has to be turned into practical solutions, which is what we expect from, from them. It's on the right track. Can we turn this roadmap into a practical vehicle? That's the question to be answered. The Trump administration feels that their bullying will terrify people into supporting their vision. It may, to a certain degree. The business community is worried, but this is short term. When the US makes such extreme demands, it further unites the world community against them. He went on to say that he's got a very good response from governments, but that even in Russia, he said, governments cannot control private companies and tell them where to invest and where not to invest. The sanctions are coming not on countries, but on companies. So as you know, we've now announced that any company that does any business with Iran will not be able to do business in the United States. And that has led to some major companies pulling out of, uh, of Iran. Maersk is one of them. Maersk is the world's greatest shipper. All those shipping containers that you see, that's that company. If they don't stop there, that's a big blow, and they're not going there anymore. Um, so his, uh, his statement was that the next step is that Somehow, governments have to provide protections for companies. Now, um, Europe is planning to establish a special financing system that will allow transactions to be made uh, between them and Iran. And the Chinese are also doing something interesting. They're establishing companies whose sole business is going to be trading with Iran. So they won't be trading with anyone else. They don't care if they're sanctioned. So various countries are trying to find ways around this. I think that this must be uh, Zarif's big uh, project now. How do we build a coalition? Uh, China, Russia, uh, Turkey, India, and perhaps the European Union, and then some others of countries that want to rebel against the arrogance of the United States to tell them uh, that they can't trade with us if they trade with Iran. And so. Uh, one of the follow-up questions was, what do you need? What, what is it that you're looking for? And he said, really, he said, it's only one thing. For us, it's about being able to sell our oil and have access to the proceeds. You know, I wrote a book about the U.S. overthrow of the government of Iran back in 1953. Mm -hmm. And that's what, the, that's what that coup was about. Mm -hmm. uh, Iran had nationalized. <laughs> It's oil, which had been previously owned by one British company, owned in turn by the British government, and financed by a big bank uh, represented by Sullivan and Cromwell and the Dulles Brothers in New York City. Um, it was Iran's determination to sell its own oil and have access to the proceeds that led to the overthrow of Mossadegh, the imposition of the Shah for 25 years, and then his overthrow by another repressive regime. So, Having access to your own oil is a thread that runs through Iranian history for more than 100 years. Somebody again said to him, what about meeting with Trump or meeting with one of the other American leaders? Why don't you want to do it? First of all, he said, nobody, they actually never asked. They, we heard some tweets, but we never got a request. But he said that was OK, because they wouldn't have responded anyway. We don't see them reliable. <laughs> I like this line. We don't believe negotiations are about trust, but they are about reliability. The talk of regime change, the illusion of regime change, the attempt to isolate Iran in the region, to bring Iran to its knees through pressure, has dominated US foreign policy for 40 years. We have gone through coalitions against Iran since a few months after our Islamic revolution. The coalition, first coalition was Saddam, the Soviet Union, and the United States. We were in total disarray. We hardly had an army. 
when he invaded us. The point is the United States is failing to recognize the realities of this region by excluding Iran. This creates chaos and uncertainty. We have, un we have withstood more difficult times, times when people and governments from around the world united to destroy us. And he went back to an interesting moment. You'll remember that in 1980 was the year Iraq invaded Iran. Uh, Iran immediately went to the Security Council and asked for a declaration. The United States delayed and delayed. It took a week before the Security Council even was able to meet and uh, have a discussion. The United States ambassador was, of course, the key figure. And in fact, he mentioned it was Don McHenry. He said, I don't know if Ambassador McHenry is still alive, but if he is, Ask him why the Security Council waited seven days. And ask him why he insisted that the resolution could not call for the withdrawal of foreign forces from Iran. And then he said something which is so Iranian. I, I, I teach this to my students. They're already telling it back to me, so I know it's getting to them. Iran has been around for so long. You know, it's ten times older than the United States. Iranians are very conscious of this. They have a deep understanding of the richness of their culture, and their history, and the long story of their political role in that part of the world. So, here's Zarif. We have seven millennia of history. Our empire lasted longer than the entire history of the United States. We have existed for millennia. A few months is nothing. This is such a difference in the way Iranians look at the world from the way Americans do. We are, uh, we want everything to get done this week. Uh, historical memory is also just that short. We can remember back to last week. Um, the Iranians see the world and their life and their country in a very, very different way. And this ties into something I've also noticed about the Iranian, Iranian character and the Iranian view of the world. And it has to do with patience. For the Iranians, if something's not going to happen now, it's not going to happen when they want, that's fine. Now, it's going to happen at some time. It's still going to happen. Everything is good. Though you don't have to push it. Iranians also have another great difference from the Western mentality. Americans are problem solvers. Give me a problem. Okay, we're going to divide it up into pieces. We'll have subcommittees. Everybody already figures out what they're going to do. We're going to have another meeting. We're going to come up with a solution. We're going to solve it. <laughs> Iranians are not like this. I have heard this over and over from Iranians. You don't solve problems. You, you adapt to them. You learn to live with them. You learn to deal with them. You don't crush them. They won't go away. They're going to be there. You have to adapt to what life gives you. Americans are not like this. We dominate. We create our own reality. Uh, and then he finished by saying, if the United States believed it could succeed with an attack, it would have done so long ago. Um, now, uh, here I want to... Uh, veer off into something about, I was talking about the tone of the meeting. So uh, one person asked a critical but a very respectful question. Some of you may know that the major environmental organization in Iraq has been closed down. They've been accused of spying with their collaboration, uh, for their collaboration with outside environmental groups as they've been out in the field trying to take measurements. They've been accused of espionage. And the leader of that group was put in jail and he died in jail. So-called suicide. <laughs> So he was asked about this, as well he should be. But it, the first person who asked it came from Low Blog, which is one of my favorite websites, if you don't know it, L-O-B-E, Low Blog. And he, he asked it in a direct way. Right. I think it's great that human rights abuses are brought to the surface and that members of governments are asked to explain. That should happen to us, it should happen to every government. So I thought that was a perfectly fine question. And he mentioned, uh, first thing Zarif said is that the president has ordered an investigation of the, uh, the jail death. But then he added, the control that we have over our judiciary, our being the elected government, is non-existent. These people are not arrested by the government. They're arrested by law enforcement officials working for the judiciary. We do not agree with many of the arrests. But that is not an area of our responsibility. <coughs> Then a certain New York Times columnist, there were three New York Times reporters there, they were the most aggressive. <laughs> this guy starts pushing, he's hectoring 
the foreign minister, and telling him that, uh, well, that we, we all know Zarif is a nice guy, but behind him is the real power. He doesn't have any real power. Um, and then he says, I wrote this down because it's such a, me, a breach of journalistic behavior. It's an issue Iran needs to confront. It's alienating the United States and other powers. That's the kind of thing I can see another foreign minister saying to him. But I don't feel like this is the responsibility of the press to point a finger at the foreign minister of another country and say, this is an issue you better look at. And I asked myself on the way out, would he have done that to the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia? I think it all comes from a uh, mindset. That even the so-called, you know, he said, even your friends are saying, the so-called <laughs> friends of Iran in the neocon community that actually don't want to bomb today, they think of themselves as the friends, um, still look at Iran with the way our government does. Well, they're kind of savages, they're pitiful, you know, they're, they're outside the world, they're isolated, they don't really know how to behave in civilized society. And I could sense this in the attitude of the, all three of, frankly, I hate to say it, of the New York Times reporters, that they're, they're trying to educate this guy, but he won't be educated because he's so dumb, he's not as smart like we are. And you could really see that coming through. Uh, so here was Zarif replying to the idea, you don't have any power. This is, again, a really good answer. Who is it that has no power? President Obama was incapable of implementing his own word during his own administration. But I implemented every line. OFAC, the, organiza the uh, Organization for Foreign Assets Control, which runs our sanctions program, OFAC was keeping sanctions on even when Obama wanted them lifted. The U.S. continued to twist the arms of banks. This was his executive order, and he could not get it obeyed. But no one in Iran was able to contradict any part of the deal. So why say that we are the country whose elected officials don't have any power? And this is when the New York Times reporter pipes back, because Iran is not the United States, with all due respect. <laughs> and Zarif immediately shoots back, I love this answer, because it sums up all of our problems. Why do you consider yourself so different? You're just another country. My request is just act like a normal country. <laughs> I, you know, he didn't, he didn't react too much against the reporter as I would, but very good answer. Um, he was asked about his talks with Kerry. You might know that he's been denounced by the Secretary of State for treason because he's talked, Kerry has spoken to Zarif. Of course, they were the lead negotiators during that long nuclear deal negotiation. And he's, he had a very nice answer. He's, Kerry has tried to convince us that it's reasonable to stay committed to the nuclear deal. Dialogue is not about converting the other side. It's about understanding, about opening yourself to seeing from a different angle. Any government in its right mind would encourage people to teach each other and learn from each other. That tells you whether our government's in its right mind or not. Um, 